joined us today. Today we have the final session of this week. Uh, we have around 50 people who have joined the session now. Let us wait one more minute to see if more people can join us. And then we can start today's session. Thank you for being here with us today and right now. And please turn on your cameras if possible. If you can please turn turn them on, that'd be great. Thank you. Prender. Yo y mientras tanto voy a, a compartir mi pantalla. In the meantime, I'm going to share my screen. En aras de, de que podamos okay. aprovechar. So that we can make most of our time, as I said, let us now begin uh, the second session this week of our course on climate environment and health responders in the Americas. As usual, we have language interpretation. So if you need the interpretation, please go to the bottom of your screen where you can select the language of your choice. This is now week four. We will have our session on how to tell stories through data. And on Tuesday and Thursday, we will have our sessions as well. Perdón, Gilma, sí, no, no, si te escuchamos perfecto. Si te escuchamos, voy a poner un mensaje en el chat para... Yes, we can hear you, uh, Gilma. I'll, I'll try to help this person who can't hear you. Okay, thank you. Um, please remember that your mics should be muted. Uh, let, let's see if we can help you, uh, you know, this person who can't hear us. As you know, we check uh, who has joined the sessions, so we check attendance uh, in this way. Please remember that to keep your cameras on during the session. Also, we will be answering your questions as we have uh, so far. Please write your questions in the chat. If we don't have enough time to address all the questions, uh, we will be answering them by email. Today we have Marcelo Renzi, our speaker. He is from Argentina. He's a freelance, freelance uh, designer. He works with data management, modeling, the use of uh, artificial intelligence. Also, he aims to uh, observe and predict human behavior. And this makes his area very interesting because the idea is to use tools in order to somehow understand how by using these tools, we can uh, get to know and predict human behavior. And in this way, we can help individuals, communities and societies uh, integrate better. And especially within our TD process, it can be very positive because we need tools to um, implement a TD process to solve TD issues, especially in our case, because we're working with climate, environment, and health. Without further ado, I would like to give the floor to Marcelo. 
I think his presentation would be very interesting and uh, you will be able to tell for yourself at the end of the talk. So let's have let's give Marcelo one hour uh, for his presentation and then the um, in the last part of the session we will have the Q&A session. Welcome Marcelo. Thank you and thank you for your time, which is always the most valuable asset we have. Thank you for turning your cameras on, although I do work with computers a lot and not with people, but the most interesting part of, you know, giving a talk is the interaction, even if it is limited interaction. And this is why I won't be using any slides or I'll try not to. Um, there are two reasons that explain this. This has to do, uh, first of all, with the fact that the slides, the visuals, you know, uh, catch our attention. We are a visual culture. They attract us. And that tends to, um, you know, uh, focus us away from words. You know, visuals do help us uh, to some extent, but in this case, I think they won't. So I will, I would like to ask you to pay uh, full attention to what I'm saying. That was number one. Number two, I won't be using slides. And this goes straight to the core of my talk. Uh, I won't be using slides because they are, they are, transparent or they seem to be transparent. If we have a chart based on date, I don't know, curves, points, whatever. When we see a chart, it seems to be authoritative. It seems to be easy to interpret at the very beginning, which equals, you know, like a good film. It's easy, it's easy to process. People like it. People think that they understand quickly which is good if what you're saying is useful and makes sense and is true mainly. But it might be uh, negative if not. A film might be very educational in an easy way, but it might be teaching uh, false things. As now we're talking about how we are going to tell stories, first of all, we need to talk about stories. I won't be telling a story. I would like to talk about how stories um, are written. Um, when you study filmmaking, you watch films, but you also discuss them. Second, maybe the title of the talk might have been maybe a bit misleading or indirect. I won't be talking about data to tell a story that we already know. I will be talking about data to put together the story. I won't be talking about rhetoric, but about analysis, which is, you know, the starting point. Mm, uh, the problem of using data to come up with stories and tell stories, first of all, is that we believe that data are privileged information, you know, from an epistemic perspective. It's, it's like, if I have data, I have a fact in my hands. And we know that that's not true. It feels true when we use data in a meeting, in a piece or on a video, it seems to be true, but it's not. That's the first mistake when we use data. The second mistake when we use data, which includes, I don't know, public policies or a spreadsheet in a private project, is that we tend to think that data are safe to use, that the difficulty in using data is so, um, can be overcome when I have the right software. Uh, that the data are the difficult part, and they're not. I think that the way to use data, or the way in which I use data, which is I think is the best, uh, according to what I read and I understand, is the following. First, uh, think about a witness report, you know, a second-hand uh, witness report. Data is never, never equals, this is what happened. 
data equals okay someone or institution is saying that they did this or someone told them that there is already an uh, indirect layer there a deep indirect layer and the police officers know this very well you know forensic work detective work is very similar to data analysis work i, I will i will be coming back to this metaphor but uh, you can also know this from any survey study or interview the data you have in a data set regardless of the level of sophistication will always be the report of the report of someone doing something you know data tell a story about how things were experienced not about what they are really so the a name in a column on a spreadsheet is always misleading it's never straightforward for instance if you have a data set set on company valuation for instance something intuitive happens for the people that are from the area and not from others you know uh, google valuation is how much money would it take to buy every google share but the valuation of an early startup is the percentage of the last in uh, investor and that has nothing to do with the second issue it's a choice many funds for instance if you invest in a company you buy another one percent for a lot of money so that the company uh, uh you know becomes a lot more expensive you know company valuation doesn't mean company valuation you know the financial field maybe is not uh is a bit abstract for us but this works at every level there is a mistake that is taken from data analysis to the charts to the stories to the to the article uh, we do this we just include a chart and we say i don't know economy relationship between the economy of a given country and uh, uh the risk of epidemics the word economy on an axis is already too ambiguous is this income mean incomes average incomes what type of income there are many assumptions there and it's not just investment it is sorry income it's income measured as uh income according to health uh constant dollar rate there are a number of uh assumptions that are not seen when we are telling the story which is fine i don't know if it's fine but it's it, it, we can't avoid it but it's very confusing so the first mistake we make when we analyze data is take the data at face value as in what it says it is and it never is the case the second thing and it's not so much a mistake but a, a trap because because of comfort issues data are always uh, uh easy to interpret according to something that can already be measured something that is already transparent but the interesting story never lies there if we didn't have official statistics for instance the the inflation uh, rate for instance we can say argentina but any example the inflation inflation rate itself would be a piece of news because it would be very difficult to est estimate something different uh, because you would need a lot more work you publish this uh, inflation rate and that's the story in itself uh but of course the government publishes these rates regularly so this stops being a story the story is behind the figure and that applies to any st uh, official statistic or data that uh, are made available therefore and we're a bit guilty of this all of us in our area data usually we say okay we have the data we can tell a story about tell a story about this but no if we have data there is no story meaning that there is nothing new to tell you can report inform people of course 
we are, we are, I don't know, transcribing someone else's tweet or a paper, and we, uh, I don't know, uh, simplify it or send it to someone else. But if there are data, there's no story. The story in the deepest sense of something new that I found and that I'm uh, telling you also appears behind the data. It's in the, in the part of the process that wasn't directly measured. When we, for instance, assess uh, climate impact or we analyze a story about education, for instance, we start with the PISA survey we use with the climate impact um, data. We start um, by analyzing other types of data as well, but that's not the story. The story should be what is behind the data. You know, the cognitive possibilities of students, future vulnerabilities, where vulnerabilities lie, what should we do, what would happen if or if not. None of that can we found in the data. It's the opposite. The story is, let's say, behind or beyond the data. I, I really like the forensic metaphor. I'll, I'll keep using it. Let's picture a building by night. Uh, there was a crime in that building. Maybe something happened. The data e equal uh, would be the, the, the surveillance cameras. We do have shots of some things that happened. Uh, they might have been uh, forged as well, but that's a different problem. If the crime is on camera, there is no detective work possible. You, you, we show the video to the jury and it's that, you know, it's been measured. Uh, no, well, there is research when the crime is not caught on camera. So the work of analysts is never to humanize data. Their work is to infer what we are not measuring or what cannot be measured from the data and from everything else. The idea is to keep the building in your mind, you know, the, the layout, the people's biographies, and using the data in order to narrow down the number of possibilities, to ha have more accurate hypotheses and to discard possibilities. But we start uh, not with the camera, but with the building. Um, clear example are opinion polls in Twitter, in social media. Always the assumption is that you have a camera and I'm measuring what Twitter says. I use artificial intelligence and neural learning, whatever it is. And, but the assumption is usually that Twitter is a hallway where arbitrary individuals uh, pass and speak spontaneously, but that is not true. Twitter is a space where people are sent to speak. There are different people. Discourse is sometimes deliberate, performative in different ways and for different reasons. So if you want to know, for example, the opinion of a population about something, using Twitter data and using all artificial intelligence to process that data and come to a result. If you don't think of a, a political analysis of who is interested in saying what, in all of the ways that information can be manipulated for with good or bad intentions, then you, so you start with it. What is outside data science starts uh, dealing with the process, uh, understanding, having your uh, a story of what is happening in the world. So essentially, you start by saying, well, I have data about this, or, or even if you don't have data, um, you are all researchers in one way or another. Um, and 
at, at least uh, in the processes that you're influencing, someone who is a manager is always having an influence, making a difference in what they are doing. So how do we think we have the world, we have parts of the world that we see directly, parts of the world that we don't because they're not visible, because they're abstract, for whatever reason, you cannot see uh, a virus, but it, it is um, a concept. So there's a part of the world that we see, a part of the world that we don't see, and there's a story. You have a story that you have learned, and then you use your observations, your data to make it more precise. So you say, well, I imagine that this was going on, and so I imagine that this project was going from regular to bad. This was my inaccurate story, but I talked to the specific person, and then my story became more accurate. The use of data to think of a story and then tell it correctly, but first to think about it, has this format. There's a story, information, making the story more accurate or saying this is not correct. The difference is that in order to do this with data, the story needs to be told in math. I don't mean complex math. Uh, in fact, uh, be suspicious of complex mathematics. There are few fields where um, complex math reflects what we know of, the, of that field correctly. Distrust, uh, those old mathematics uh, models that are a lot more complex than what the, a certain field merits. But we need to tell it in a uh, mathematics, mathematical way, even if at least is when this goes up, this other thing goes down. We have an issue on one side. If I don't tell the structure of my story precisely, then I cannot use the data to improve it. I have, well, this influences this other thing. But if I don't have a precise way where I can put that information, to help, uh, and on the other side, if I make my story too precise, if I say for every extra dollar in the mean income in a country, uh, certain things decreases by a 0 0.00 something percent, um, it's, is the data uh, consistent with this or that, I can use it for that, but I cannot make it, I cannot make the story more precise with my data. Um, this is something that I'm going to repeat a lot, but all of these kinds of stories are stories told by an expert in an area in medicine, management, biology, physics, whatever it is. And with math as precise as uh, necessary for being able to tell that story precisely, but not uh, precise uh, enough to step over uh, our data. So it's a thing uh, that needs software, but it's not a software issue. It needs math uh, up to a certain point, but it needs also experience. It's not something that you can learn in, in an hour tutorial. It's not something that I can show you five slides and, and say, this is how it is, and, and that's it. I speak a lot of, of the fake or misleading transparency of a graph, so I don't wanna be misleading myself. You learn this. If you, if you do it, if you don't know how to do it, you can work with people who do it. It's usually a lot more useful 
to have an expert in a field with a solid story of what's going on with someone who has an experience in bringing the in, incorporating math into that other than an expert in a field that doesn't have a solid uh, knowledge uh, or a data scientist who has a lot of experience in that and is not uh, has not no idea of what they're bringing that math into so this it's an interaction of experts strictly between them it's not a light use of someone else's expertise so i'm being a bit harsh perhaps but this is is when this happens is very powerful i'm going to contradict myself again um, i'm going to tell you very quickly about a story i made for myself about a field that is public healthcare medicine that I, I don't know about. So listen to the general idea, be charitable. This was an example of me speaking of something I shouldn't be talking about. So I was curious about um, income improves health. The higher my income, the better my health. So out of curiosity and to practice, I said, well, I have this idea in my head. How, how much uh, uh, truth is there? So uh, this is where the art comes in. And so I had this uh, idea. And so before putting it in math, I went to look at what data there was available. Uh, first, we start uh, with the doubt, the story, the crime. You don't start with the data and then say, what do I do with them? Then you start with a problem and then you go look for the data. So I found uh, data, city level data for the US about income and health results. and right then i had to change my story i wasn't thinking of my income and my health but the aggregate income and aggregate health and it's important to be honest here at this point we all assume that everyone who is here has intellectual integrity in what we do but there's another step that is to be, for example, annoying with journalists when they print something and commentators when they print something and with people uh, who use their research and, and data because um, the clarity that we say, this is what I'm doing and this is not, this can be deduced and this cannot, is lost when the research becomes public. You have seen this in any uh, journalistic, well, there are exceptions, of course, but practically in all journalism about uh, constructive analysis, it's well, if it's well done, but it's not told correctly. Uh, so part of our job is for it to be to make sure that it is told correctly, even if it's annoying or bothersome. So um, because of intellectual honesty, I had to think, well, I'm looking at cities. So if there's a correlation, the higher the income, the better the health, then the question is different. If it's yes or no, the, the answer is going to be different, but, but it was the data that I had. So the first thing I did was make my idea, my model, my narrative more specific. And I'm cheating here because I'm saying um, mathematized uh, stories and you're going to read mathematical no models. And those models are a story that is made so precise that I can use it with that story. 
if you take that that model um, it gives an epistemical entity that it doesn't have but sometimes it can take you out of, of the tool so you need to integrate it it's a it's a story translated um, perhaps um, make it made more poor so i'm going to say um, I'm referring to a model, but I'm, I'm speaking of, ma I'm saying mathematizing my story. The story I had in my mind, of course, you can imagine it wasn't easy. So if your income is at this level, if, the, if your income increases by a certain percentage, then your mortality uh, lowers. The important thing is how it is said, how that is said. And here again, honesty. If I did a graph, I looked at the points in the chart and I saw what happened. And, but graphs can be terribly misleading. It depends on the units to start. If you change income units with doesn't have an obvious definition or mortality, um, you have residual age mortality, different, uh, lots of, of different uh, kinds of mortalities. You all know this better than me. And you can, so you can transform a set of things that has no relation with a horizontal line that is the one story, then a vertical line that tells a different story. So we need to always um, not believe the, the graph. The story that is told by the graph is not the story. Or to say it other way, um, there's a lot of assumptions as good politicians, they assume a model of the world and they def and it defends it, but it doesn't specify it. And our job is to specify this. So I specified this model, but without saying, uh, what, uh, how much, uh, when it increases, what the number is. I introduced uh, ranges. It, it wasn't just simply ranges, but a, a previous, uh, a prior idea using ranges. Then I entered the data to make that story more precise, to make the numbers are more or less this and this and I could see that a slight improvement in income uh, translated from mathematical numbers. Um, so uh, a slight increase in income, slightly improved um, mortality. But the process itself of taking the data and using them to make a story that was already in mathematical terms, more precise, is a lot more delicate than it may seem. You can see that software is very easy to use and, and that's great. The problem is that it's so easy to use that it hides the complexity, uh, the conceptual complexity of what you're doing. It's very easy. Um, te uh, software that we use for this, Today, these days, it's like a Tesla. It works uh, very well for its purpose, but if you think it's automatic, you're going to crash. So that's why I say, even if you have the software, until you have the experience of what can go wrong, how can you see what is wrong? Um, you only gain that with time. So unless you have that experience, it's very doubtful uh, what you can do. So I did this. Then I had a, another novel idea. And I said, well, you can tell a story in aggregate terms or you can do it more precise. And so then I, I said, is it the same with cancer mortality or with cardiovascular disease? So I separated that using the same variables and units. 
So there's a, a lot of work. It's not very sophisticated. It's not brain surgery, but uh, to compare things, we, we need to know how to compare things. And so um, interestingly for me, perhaps you already knew this, it showed that income increases at the city level improves cardiovascular mortality and not uh, cancer mortality. So I had a story that I told myself, and it was that we have good tools that we know about that are solid, strong, to improve cardiovascular disease, and we are uh, well behind with cancer. So having money improves uh, cardiovascular results because you know what to do with that money, but in cancer, in cancer, we are lagging behind. If you print this in a journal or in the newspaper, it, you have mathematician proves that um, you, we can't fight cancer. And perhaps, but the precise story is the math. And then the way I tell that, there's always the, the risk of diluting that, turning something that is true that perhaps is not that interesting or enlightening and ruining that. And perhaps I had, I didn't know so much about uh, cancer programs or cardiovascular programs. If someone has already studied this, perhaps this is obvious, but the risk is always taking something that is not literally precise, but it's interesting and to tell something uh, that I measured with precision. So the data is always an indirect witness that we, can, we know how to use if you apply the math correctly. The two things that you can do, not that you can do, um, it, what can happen is on one hand, I took the data and the data made my story less inaccurate or the data, um, I uh, changed the story. I thought this influenced this, uh, but it didn't. And both are important. And I want to suggest are have to do with accounting when we make a, a paper uh, public or when we publish something when we discuss it in a meeting we're always telling that story and the fundamental risk or friction that exists when we use data in our work the title of, of this presentation is telling stories. So you can imagine a slide, a presentation, a talk, but we also tell stories when discussing things with our colleagues, when we're in a meeting, uh, when we're in the bathroom thinking of what we're going to do on this week. We have a story in our head. De trabajar con datos. The main benefit of working with data is that stories are not mandatory. But if we use data to make figures more accurate in the wrong story or a story that is unclear, or if we have the, an unclear model, then the whole thing is useless. I have worked many times with companies that had amazing databases they had amazing professionals in their areas, data analysis, you know, they were brilliant. Uh, it wasn't me, it was other people. And they conducted these complex analysis that would, you know, um, fail terribly. Because when those figures, when those analyses were used to make decisions, they were used to uh, fine tune models of the world that were wrong. The story was off because the manager, the CEO or whoever used the data to 
um, shed light on a story they thought they were clear about. And that's, you know, hitting the gas pedal in the wrong direction. Each, every model, every story, I'll go back to the vehicle metaphor. Uh, I would need to devote some time to this as well. Each model is an explanation, a prediction, and something uh, counterfactual or can be used like that. Every model, every narrative, even human narratives, are like this. If Ulysses um, uh, sailors hadn't uh, eaten Apollo's um, uh, insights, then the things would have been different. But that's implicit in the story. When you analyze data, that analysis can be used and will be used if you're not careful to say, well, if this happened because of this, then that other thing will happen because of that. Or if they had done some other thing, then this would have happened. So a model explains predictions, um, and that is always a political act in its more general uh, sense, uh, in the more general sense of the term, because it's always assigning responsibilities, you know, uh, blames or glories. I don't know, during my administration, the economy has improved uh, so and so percent. That's a narrative, you know, an implicit model that is used, that is being used to, you know, hail their own glories. And, uh, you might need a chart with the growth of, of the economy. And then you see something like, okay, my administration, the economy just boomed. And because the, the chart shows you that. And that's like, yes, that's a demonstration. He's using data, he's using a chart. Uh, um, the, the charts or graphs are well designed. So that looks good. But if your um, narrative model for the economy is the following, for instance, the economy depends on this, this and that and the factors of, I don't know, wealth economy, commodities, etc. And I use the data to say, well, this is my story. And I fine tune the figures and the relationships as well, regarding the figures and the facts, then I can use, for instance, what, what can be measured, I don't know, an interest rate, in order to deduce more accurately what cannot be measured, which is the efficiency of an administration, because this is very ambiguous. So if I do that, if that's my model, I might come up with a different interpretation. For instance, with these, uh, at these interest rates, etc., the economy would have improved, uh, I don't know, uh, so-and-so percentage more. Uh, and you, then you show a chart, you know, with the uh, the expected curve for the economy and also the curve that is um, underneath it's the same da data same graph same order of quantification and modeling uh, if i use a simple model it's one thing but if i let's say train my ai to predict the economy for instance i can show a transparent believable clear a graph that complies with all uh, design best practices and the headline, the newspaper headline would be AI, AI shows that the administration is off or the opposite, AI shows that administration is doing great. So uh, all of this depends on how structurally, structurally accurate my model of the world is. The, the narrative I used to put together the data. Never ask about the data first. First ask about the model, the narrative model. I never tell the data. First tell the narrative. Even if you find a model, and I, I don't want to bore you with causation, relationships, etc. You know, it's a bit of a, a cliche. 
Um, you can prepare a graph with people, including people, uh, including trap lovers and tango lovers, and you can uh, conclude that tango uh, is um, lethal for health. But but that's not true. It's a lie. Of course, all the people like tango and they die um, earlier. But that correlation is false. So not every narrative that fits with the model is good. When the model makes sense and the figures are now more accurate, even if all that happens, maybe my model uh, is not predictive. Uh, this happened and then that and then that. OK, I understand. I can predict cardiovascular mortality to some extent and make correlation with uh, musical tastes. It works. What I can't do is modify that and getting people to go from liking tango to li liking trap. If you're in the area of health, you know this already. What I would like to say is that things are more general than this. Don't believe people when someone says these, this mathematical model predicts this and that and that. It's the same narrative. It's the same possibility of fooling yourself, but, but it's just a little bit more accurate. In general, this is a problem that we are to tell. So to use the data, I needed to fine tune my narrative. And that's a problem because most of the times it's not just, you know, in the newspaper and TV, imagine a meeting. Um, it's not that common to be in a meeting where people say, okay, this is the company's or project's mathematical model. Let's discuss this. It's not like that. It's always, we have this, I don't know, kind of story uh, that is a little bit disguised with figures. So, you have your narrative, now it's more accurate. And then you have a problem that you can tell. There is this cultural fiction and psychological fiction as well. Second, many times we measure our narrative. And what is interesting is what cameras did not show, you know, the environment um, outside the shots. And there you can, there we can find the factor that cannot be measured, the abstract factor. This has happened to me. Um, I'm going to speed up a little bit to have time for questions. Um, uh, usually, when I do things for money, let's say I cannot tell you about them because you sign, you know, confidentiality contracts. But this one I can tell you about. Um, I wanted to assess the efficiency of uh, the Argentinian economy over time. I wanted to uh, uh, explain this history to myself. You know, I wanted to have a clearer picture of what had happened. So I worked with GDP per, ca per capita in constant dollar values. Oh, those data are available. That's fine. And then I said, OK, agriculture depends on external factors. So I remove agricultural economy. Productivity depends you know, children don't work, ideally. Uh, so I, I, you know, I select my age range. World economy goes up and down, technology goes up over time. So I adjust according to the total global productivity level. I did all that. And I got a figure that I think is closer to the figure reflecting the Argentinian economy over time. Now, the chart showing that the headline, if I had published it somewhere, would have been uh, easy to understand. You know, it's a figure going up and down over time, something political happened, it went up or down, whatever. Uh, the intuitive story writes itself. The problem is that if I want to be honest and I use the right words to address the variable, then the chart you know, has an axis with a huge label. We do this all the time. When we say, when we say LIBOR rate, GDP, life expectancy at birth, and we write life expectancy. Many of you know 
that that's a, that's a complex statistical calculation with specific definitions and it means something that might not be what the chart reader understands you know the, the reader might not know what this represents every variable has a measure that can be measured or not uh, and for instance, in inflation has an intuitive and uh, precise meaning, variables do in general. This intuitive meaning entails cultural accumulation of its use. The uh, exchange rate gap in Argentina is intuitive. You know, you, you get, uh, talk to someone in the street who's over five years old, they already know about this exchange rate gap. They understand it or think they do, but that doesn't matter. They know about it, you know, they read a chart and they understand the chart. That is not the case in other countries. You know, then this problem of fine tuning these variables that cannot be measured is that many times if the story is new, interesting, if the model is new or, or it has a specific result that is not measured, otherwise it's, it's no fun. And at the same time, it's usually something new. Therefore, there is no cultural tradition. Uh, so in my in the axis in my chart, I need to make it you know really really long with the label, and nobody understands the thing, and people read the chart, and that's that. Or I use a more general label, you know, the more intuitive label, the closest one. And I might be lying in that case. Maybe what I said is not what the, uh, they thought I said. There are no easy solutions. There is no way to tell a story with a new stakeholder that doesn't involve the slow and collective education of the audience on this story. So the first vampire in the story had to be explained at some point, but not any longer, okay? So every new variable needs to be explained. I have talked at length about charts, you know? I'm criticizing them, but I won't. I won't be, it's not that I don't like charts, but this hasn't been a problem because um, I work with people who are good story storytellers. Rhetoric, so saying something in a believable and persuasive way is not easy. It's not neutral, you know, it's powerful, but we have a tradition. Nowadays, you might find people who are very good at preparing a nice chart, a slide, that has to be done. It's not me, but it can be done. What I wanted to say today is what comes before, you know, not using data to make a story I told myself believable. The idea is to use data to find a better story, a more real story, a more interesting story. Finally, let us now have, uh, I'm gonna introduce an exercise not to do now, it's not an exercise, it's a, it's a life practice. It will take you uh, too long. It might be frustrating or better said, uncomfortable. And it's the most valuable technique I know. And it's generally intellectually valuable in general. You know, children should do this at school. Take a sport, it doesn't matter which. It should be a sport that people uh, gamble uh, on in Las Vegas, American football, baseball, whatever. Something that, that is easy to find that there are journalistic pieces about, you know? And also that people bet on this sport a lot. <laughs> find a game that was against the odds, you know, Las Vegas, uh, bet on something and the game had a different result, although the opposite results. Read the coverage of the, of the game before the game, especially the ones that 
agreed with Las Vegas odds and try to think, try to write a story on how games work according to that coverage. You know, journalistic coverage may be, I don't know, the Martians team is emotionally uh, down because they lost their games and the Moon team is feeling great and they're going to win because uh, they feel great. And that's the narrative of how a, lost, a game is lost or won. Take a note of all that. And, and make it more mathematically accurate. It depends on how this depends on how comfortable you feel with maths. It might be uh, I have a model that I have analyzed, and this might include variables: how I did before, then how I feel, and then I lose or I win. The most important thing is what uh, causes what, and it's not the equation in itself. Once you have that equation or those arrows, read the coverage of the game after the game has taken place. There will be lots of it. And try to translate that into uh, the language of the previous narrative, you know? What happened? Maybe this depended on that, or the Martian steam, you know, they were doing really well at the beginning, but that story of if I lose, then I'm not so excited is not true. Maybe they were, were feeling very well, but they did well at the beginning and then they improved, you know, the, the, they became more excited. And I think that the narrative and the mathematical model then uh, would be how I did before my uh, spirit at the beginning of the game, how I did it at the beginning, how I felt afterwards, and do I lose or do I win? So what I did was make my model more sophisticated. Think about which data you would have liked to have, or which witnesses, which measurements. You know, uh, I don't know, um, if the players had slept well, what they discussed, at the gym, it doesn't matter if you can get them or get the information or not. But think about the information you would have needed in order to, to make a better prediction than Las Vegas. What you would you have needed uh, to apply this modified model? If um, if this had happened, if what would you have needed to get a better model than that that Las Vegas applied? Sorry, Marcelo, you have five minutes. Yes, well, thank you. Well, so the purpose is not to um, discredit or to go against Vegas. This is, uh, Vegas has people who do this for money, have been doing this for decades. Um, it doesn't matter. But the point is that that precise narrative process from the coverage, then something happens, I get new data, I change, or make more, my narrative more precise, that intellectual process of, of thinking with data and working with data and making decisions with that data, you can do it first with sports, then with things that you see in the newspaper or in journals, and then things in your fields, um, scientific papers, uh, project reports, and then with the things that you your, yourselves have published or even emails or slides. So that is, it requires a constant practice and that is more useful and it's necessary before bringing data down to uh, and using tools to apply them and hiring a specialist. Uh, do that. Uh, speak uh, among yourselves and anybody else that you meet that is doing this, because that language, we could say it's a, a literary genre and you learn it by speaking it. You learn to write sonnets by writing sonnets. 
you learn to moderate by moderating and reading uh, other people's work. So discuss that, discuss that a lot. Even if you don't use data software, um, that will improve anyways. And if you use the data, even better. So we have three extra minutes. Um, you can ask any questions and thank you for an hour of your time, which again is the only thing you cannot buy and repurchase and anything. So thank you. Thank you so much, Marcelo, for your great presentation and for your perspective on what is behind data and how to use data in this interface process that we're trying to do between climate and health. We have many questions, so I will proceed with those so that we can use this 20 minutes that we have and trying to answer those questions. The first question that we have is, when you speak about mathematizing a story, we can think of acyclical directed graphics as the concept representation that is simplified and um, to the point of that story associated with um, models. It's the contemporary concept tool. The first to uh, answer is yes, ideally, it's a syntax that is very useful for this. And in general, is the one that we tend to use. So the first thing, the important thing is to do it somehow. If you learn to use those, yes, awesome, tend to use those. Uh, that could be the ideal syntax for this, but I know a lot of people who know the theory and don't know how to use them. But yes, use them if you can. And then the other question we have is how can we use the mathematical model to propose um, control and surveillance measures for emerging diseases? Well, um, to give the credit for, for the, to the discipline um, and the area, you know that these uh, the knowledge is available, whether it's used or not, that, that's a different thing. But I think that many times the, the gap that exists is that we haven't been able to tell the uh, appropriate story. I've done a very surface level analysis uh, because I don't know a lot about epidemiology, about how poorly or well, many countries dealt with the COVID pandemic, taking into account their economies, the populations, their climates. It's not surprising. Of course, you know that um, this uh, pandemic, um, some, some countries did very poorly. Uh, uh, for example, uh, in the in a country that had a very strong economy, but there was a narrative saying even that the um, as you all very very well know that saying that the pandemic didn't exist. So the external pandemic was the narrative was incorrect. They used graphics and they used the epidemiological models. So. On the one side, if you had a precise narrative of what causes what, of course, that in, that's better. That helps even to know at what variable I need to look at. What do I need to measure or infer what I can't measure? But that is a technical improvement in applied epidemiology that is useful, that it's great. But the bottleneck, I think that what the pandemic has taught us is not the scientific work, 
but the consistency in the implementation in, in public health of what we know. Uh, so partly is uh, how do we explain the public what causes what? And secondly, how do we ensure that um, decision making also takes that into account? That is an issue. How can decision making be more rational in this sense uh, that the narrative told by a government, a secretary, a, a secretary uh, or ministry, um, that is uh, very important, as, as important as what appears in, in Twitter. And it's um, we have a lot less uh, explanations or studies about this. So how do we use this? to improve uh, this or that process. And uh, if the bottleneck is this and not that, many times in the narrative, you need to know where does the success here come from? Um, this or helps or this doesn't help. But sometimes we have um, the metrics, for example, I'm data driven and I'm measuring health performance. I ask for variables and I get those. But if my narrative isn't correct about what uh, inf has an influence and what doesn't, and out of all the things that I can change, then I have lots of graphs and I can move uh, a lot of things, a lot of moving parts and, and then, but nothing works. So in finance, in climate change prevention, uh, lots of areas, the, this it's the same. So there's the climate change narrative that is more precise. The idea that if I change my car for an electric car, what does it impact and what does it not impact? But if I change that car, but then I use coal for energy, uh, how influential are plastic bags? So we have an issue on what variables affect what variables, even if you agree that, that climate change is real. Um, in general, our narrative as a culture of what is influential, what does uh, have, has a direct impact or not. I'm, I'm sorry um, if I'm going to further into this, but this is important. In some cases, you have a very perfect narrative. This affects this and this impacts this. You cannot say, uh, as they say in Facebook or in Meta, uh, your job is to fall in love with this product. So if all having uh, people uh, do something that they, they have no control over is something a fascist government does. That's not what we want. But out of the most useful things we have in a quantitative analysis is how much influence. Uh, many times when you have a, a lever that you know affects something, but that affects uh, th that thing only in a small percentage. So you might kill yourself doing something, but then the effect is very small. This happens a lot in companies. You have a, a narrative that says this depends on this, this changes this. Life is finite, we have little time. So if my job is to push this lever, if I'm working in a ministry that has this lever, and this lever only moves a half percentage point, it's very complicated for, uh, for me to be convinced that even if, if I do everything correctly, uh, I, I'm only uh, moving this this far and that that is okay. So it's very uh, unlikely that I will say, well, okay, take my budget away. Uh, that's as far as I can go. Is it possible for a private or public organization to take that story, believe that story, and then say, okay, I'm gonna stop doing this. It's as complicated as them saying, okay, I, 
will do this. So convince to convince is to change decisions. And the decision is perhaps changing a budget. I, how do you do that? I am, I have no idea. I am awful at doing that, at convincing people to change their decisions based on, on the processes, on models. They pay for me to design their processes, but I don't know how to uh, transform those in a change, into a change in behavior. That is going to be up to you because we don't know how to do that. Thank you, Marcelo. Here we have another question. Um, can images replace um, graphics, data graphics or, or charts, or can they be used to, to tell the story? Yes, to tell, to convince people they are as useful as a film, as a chart. Uh, the, the thing is that the story needs to be perfect. I'm sorry again, because these presentations Perhaps, uh, perhaps the title wasn't um, correct. Uh, this isn't about uh, telling stories, but telling yourself a story, uh, your own story with data, so that then you can tell a good story. And so, yes, uh, stories, um, charts, images, text, film, the a perfect graphic design, all of that helps, and it's enormously powerful, but the thing isn't the rhetorical efficiency or, or that is an issue, but it's not my issue. The issue for me is that the story needs to be novel, needs to be as precise as possible, but not too precise. And then after you, you have that settled, then yes, sure, bring all of the recourses all of the resources. Um, otherwise, it's in a, uh, insufficient. There's a Hippocratic um, principle in this thing that we do. Don't say nonsense. Do not uh, cause harm. Don't publish a model that doesn't feature data. And if you're a journalist, by God, don't print something on something that the PR representative from a university said, uh, read the paper. The, scientific, the scientist is honest. The paper is precise in what they say. There's an abstract and, and they take that and from the generic abstract and they print anything in the newspaper. So something that is, that, that is also part of our work. In our context, it would be using precaution mechanism. Yes, this has an impact on infrastructure, medical treatments. Um, if you want to say this, then set of stories that we tell ourselves is our mythology. In this mythological organization is our structure. The mythology is that if I do this, this changes the world. The most powerful and delicate thing, and the reason that I'm sometimes not hired back is that when you make that myth precise and you apply the data to check that, the organization actually pre prefers to fail rather than to change the myth. And the rhetorical and the rhetorics in that is very complicated and it's emotional, but the thing is that it needs to be emotional about what it's affected. In, in transdisciplinarity, I don't think there's uh, just mathematicians and science and other scientists or governments. I think it goes deeper than that. People who can dispassionately uh, make a myth precise, then throw data at it, and then make it more precise and perhaps break it. We do that with emotion, but we need to leave emotion aside. And working with people who can emotionally convince and prophesize, little or, or perhaps nobody can do both. I cannot do both. 
when you build your teams, what's important is to bring those two together, the honest politician who is going to, or who can convince, but who chooses to convince about what is the correct thing and what works with the scientist who knows what is the correct thing to do. So that's the thing we need, the combination between analysis and rhetoric, between a model and a myth. Thank you, Marcelo. Here we have a question that perhaps in um, also refers to some of the things you just said, but then how can we bring together the mathematical model with a story that we intend to disseminate so that it can be useful for whoever is, that story is, is aimed? Well, that's the thing. I only know how to do the first half. The second half is, it's not a technical answer. Um, there's another issue is that any model that, that you can use, and this might be sad, but any model that you can use some, uh, to convince of, of something that something works, you can use it to convince people of something that doesn't work. The same graphs, all of those. You can use it to, to tell the truth and that, or, or, or not. There are no different tools you if you find people who can convince and make them or, or convince them to help convince of this the people who can do politics who can move a, a, a team or a department and work with them to move them in the right direction the narrative that, that we need. We're not in a culture where if I show you a structural equation that is well fitted, that changes what you're going to do tomorrow. That, that's not out the culture we're in. So the interface between that and a change in behavior in, in individuals or a group, if I knew how to do that, I would be giving a different uh, presentation. So uh, connect and, and link up with whoever knows how to do that. That's all I can say, and I, I leave that open-ended. If you can do that, if you can convince, if you can negotiate, coordinate, join people uh, who can analyze. There's nothing more powerful than a powerful model given power. and. Morally, at least, it's not sufficient just to have the, the powerful model. So thank you. Let's go to the next question. Next question. Which uh, tools easy to access do you recommend to understand stories from data and figures? Uh, data scientists. There's many of us and we're not expensive, okay? It's not true now that there's few of us and that we're expensive. Uh, and this this is, a, I think, the, the summary of the whole talk. The idea of being able to, you know, take data and use an easy tool without intellectual training and put it together with that a true unbelievable story is, you know, false. It's a myth in itself. I can take the data, there are tools, and you can produce a chart and the chart might be believable. Okay, up to that, we agree. But you skipped the, the, the preparation of the model, you know, this intellectual work of iterating your narratives, your internal narratives and fine tuning the model and creating. There is no easy tool. There might be an easy tool for epidemiology, uh, maybe. Uh, what, what's the easy tool? We're hiring an epidemi epidemiologist. The good thing is that you can find one, but there is no real path or easy path towards modeling or 
towards geometry. Great, thank you. So one more question to finish. Here they are asking you to provide an example of how you can write, we can write a story on climate, environment and health, considering how each science works so that we can then design a model and tell a coherent narrative. Well, it's, it's a wide uh, area, you know. Uh, if you say climate, health and economy, you, you include almost everything. What I would uh, suggest is an example. Let us ask ourselves. So you want you want uh, political support, and that's why you're addressing a larger audience, or are you talking to a smaller audience? I think that we we won't make people much more aware aware uh, uh, about climate change. Ex uh, may, maybe there might be a few exceptions, but raising people's awareness. That's been done already, you know, that the story, that story, that narrative, people have already believed. Uh, the idea is to ask ourselves, how can I collect data to have to write a narrative on climate, climate change and health in order to improve or influence the behavior of a group uh, of people or the activity of a company or specific group? If that's our question, I would suggest the following. Start by, start by having the right uh, narrative regarding what matters to this pe these people in particular, you know, to this group, what impacts their decision making, and model that into the past. We might work with, I don't know, public health. How many people will die? How many people will vote for me? It doesn't matter. But model into the past so that you can get to climate change and health variables that have an impact, a real impact on what people, that group of people want to do. I don't know, these people want to have uh, um, reliable dengue statistics, for instance. Then you model back or into the past, and that depends on a number of factors that include the climate. And they include also health infrastructure. So you model into the past until you get to their decisions. Uh, for instance, uh, what's my dengue uh, prevention budget? If you design an accurate model, or as accurate as possible, that maps out what the, uh, how CEH is important to them and what they do already, if you take that and use the data to make the model accurate, and then you can persuade them of, what, uh, of uh, the gap, then maybe you will be able to persuade them that if you do this, then this other thing will improve. Or unless you do this, then this that is already happening will affect you in, in this other way. Of course, you are the experts in this area. If you say, if you start showing them that the rainfall pattern in a given region you know, influences dengue statistics, which is what they care about in this context, you have to show them. This is your budget curve for this. This is a climate change curve, the rainfall uh, curve, and in the future, there will be this impact. With this budget curve, your epidemic uh, curve will surge, you know, but if you change your budget uh, curve, then there will be a drop in your epidemics uh, rate. And that's the general structure of how you explain you um, explain to persuade someone to help them. You need to impact their decisions and connect that, uh, connect what you care about with what they care about. If you can connect those dots and you can do that rhetorically, uh, but you should do this with a model, with the figures, with the data, and you should 
adapt the model, you know? There should be a causal relationship. If this happens, this other thing happens. If you manage to design that model, you have a deep intellectual model to persuade yourself, and maybe you will be able to persuade other people that if they want to change things, they need to change other things first. <laughs> This is, I believe, the, the most powerful tool to do this when it comes to results, you know, building this model. Well, thank you very much. I think that you have just said uh, is very important because it shows us the importance of uh, narrative and the data. And this will depend on the question you have in order to get the data you need and also the data narrative in order to create the context. I think that something very interesting that you have showed us is that from each discipline, regardless of uh, the fact that you have a quantitative or qualitative approach, we need to keep in mind uh, how the data are generated, you know, that narrative, that context, that way allow us to create the interfaces with other disciplines be them quantity or qualitative. This is what empowers us and that allows us to create a way to do things differently, which is basically transdisciplinarity in order to take action. And to do this, we need to inv involve different stakeholders, as you have said at the end, political uh, decision makers, managers, budget specialists, those who know the process, uh, of disease transmission and how that can be mathematically modeled. There is no single answer. It has to do with uh, a behavioral change within our disciplines. We should change. We should have you know, a different uh, perspective and we need to find the language to interact with others. For instance, regarding health, I started to work with climate people and they talked to me about mitigation and adaptation. And that had a different meaning in the context of disasters or pandemics. So I had to you know, create this interface with them so that they would understand that to us, uh, this might be our uh, prevention levels might be similar to mitigation adaptation and that facilitated our working process. I think that's a main takeaway. How myself from the discipline, from my discipline, how I can contribute uh, different mechanisms to uh, reduce the uncertainty uh, rates. We haven't addressed uncertainty here, but it's also interesting. Uncertainty management is key mathematically, and it also makes it impossible to, to do this uh, accurately. It's like you either need uh, to become a data scientist or you hire one, you know, there's no magic button to process all this, uh, if you know, if you're being honest. Yes, and also reducing that uncertainty with different perspectives. We need to know the context and know what comes from uh, the data. This might be useful as well, not to have 0% uncertainty, but to reduce it. Well, thank you so very much, Marcelo. It has been very interesting. Thank you for the opportunity and for your attention. Thank you, Marcelo. Thank you, everyone, for turning on your cameras and for the interesting questions you have asked. There are some questions you, questions we haven't addressed, but we will by email. Uh, so um, we'll see each other again next week on Tuesday and Thursday. Um, please remember uh, teams and, and individual, individual participants, please remember to interact with the teams so that you can join them if possible and if you have some if you have questions please talk to your facilitators thank you very much and have a great rest of the day thank you bye bye thank you